the Menagerie Trilogy, and the Pet Trouble series, as well as a contributing author to the best-selling Spirit Animals and Seekers series. When we had Tui here at the festival in 2019, so many of her fans showed up that we couldn't accommodate them all in the room where she was giving her presentation. Tui graciously agreed to do a second presentation later in the day and spent a lot of time interacting with her fans who had come from all over just like I know many of you have today. When RIT gave us the use of their auditorium, we knew we needed to offer it to Tui and her devoted fans. Yay! We hope you enjoy the presentation and then stay afterward to have books you've purchased here signed by Tui on stage. One or two we ask is the maximum. And I know I heard from some of you that you own all the books in the series. She also has some book plates. She could sign one or two for you um, if you're not purchasing a book. But check out this selection and let's give a big warm welcome to Tui's Evelyn. Like, uh, fellow dragonettes out of their eggs and all of their different reactions to being in 
underground in this cave. Um, and then just went back and rewrote it again. <laughs> and then actually didn't even use that scene in the book. Um, it does show up in the graphic novel, the very beginning of this, um, of, I think it's this one, where you actually see them hatching, you see the, like, the Guardian's reactions to it. Book two, the beginning of Animus Magic. So um, people sometimes ask me where Animus Magic came from. And it's funny because I know they mean like in the world, but as a writer, it came from like a throwaway line in book one, where I was like, the little dragons, a couple of them, have escaped from this cave where they've been trapped underground. And they're trying to get back into the cave to rescue their like siblings, basically. And they get to the door, they go down this tunnel, and there's a giant boulder blocking the way. And I said to myself, well, what, why can't they just roll the boulder aside? Like, what's, what's going on here? So I had them have a little conversation about like, how do we get through the door? And like, why can't we get through the door? And one of them said, oh, maybe it's enchanted. And I was like, yeah, what if it's some, um, I don't know, animus magic? <laughs> and then I had the other dragon say, no, no, there's no animus magic anymore. Like, all those dragons, that's like an old story. Like, they're very, very rare. So I was like, oh, that's just like a fun little detail I'll throw into book one. And then as I started writing book two, and I realized I wanted it to be a murder mystery, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if the answer to the murder mystery had to do with the animus magic, and there was actually still animus dragons in this world. And so I was like, I'll just sneak it in a little bit in book two. And then gradually animus magic like grew and grew until it like took over the whole series by book 10. <laughs> but, um, but that was sort of how it started, which is this one line where I was like, oh, I'll just mention this thing that used to happen, and then fill it all in. And then I just wanted to show you this because I think it's kind of hilarious. It's the, uh, the cover. This is the same book. This is, but published overseas. So this is the cover if you buy it in England and the cover if you buy it in Germany. And I just think it's so cool to see. Yeah. <laughs> so what different designers and different publishers decide they want to do with the dragons and like how they visualize it, which is so different from what I have in my head sometimes. Book three. Thank you. It's here to save the day and do all the talking. <laughs> so book three was one of my very favorites to write um, because Lori is really cool. She's a lot cooler than me. Um, she's really, I find her very interesting and in the rainforest is this really cool setting. But one of the reasons I loved it so much is I introduced this character, Kikaju. And especially once we got to doing the graphic novel of book three, and it was really funny because I have someone named Barry who goes through my books and like writes them into graphic novel scripts. So he takes everything that he reads in my novel and tries to fit it into like what a graphic novel would be. And so he got to Kinkajou and he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, this character talks too much. We don't have enough word balloons. Um, and so his first version of this manuscript, um, like Kinkajou talked way less. And I went, you know, I get to read through it and make comments and changes. And so I got to that part and I was like, no, it's it's actually kind of essential that she talks this much. It's kind of the core of her personality, especially when she meets Glory at a time where she hasn't had really anyone to talk to or anyone to talk back to her. And so when we meet her, it's just her talking, her pages. So I actually like went to my editor and I was like, can we have some extra pages in the graphic novel just to add in all of King Duke's dialogue again? <laughs> and she was like, can we cut something else? And I was like, yes, this is the most important thing. <laughs> it's King Duke Yip Yapping. So that's what we did, and that's how we managed to fit in um, a lot more of um, like very essential dialogue, is what I did. And then the other thing I wanted to tell you about book three, you probably have heard me talk about how much I love sloths. I, I would, that's like why I would want to be a rain wing, so I could have my own pet sloth. And so one of the coolest things that I've gotten to do in the last year is um, for my son's 10th birthday, we went to the Bronx Zoo and got like a private meeting with a sloth for my son. Um, <laughs> totally. And so, um, this, is, this is him getting to meet the slop. Oh my god, you guys. I wanted to show you a picture of me saying kind of the slop, but all the pictures, my face was like, oh, I just look ridiculous because I'm so excited. <laughs> so he managed to look beautiful and calm at the same time. So, But it was so exciting. They're so sweet and they're so sleepy. And um, I just feel like they're such a spirit animal for me. <laughs> Starflight. Starflight is our sweet bookworm character. Um, so it says here, save the world, get the girl. No? Um, 
And I will say, the sort of like behind the scenes secret about Starflight is when I started writing the series, I really thought Starflight and Sunny would end up together. I really was thinking, I'm writing this story where he's been in love with her his whole life and then she's gonna realize it and they'll be perfect for each other and it'll be amazing um, until I got to writing their books. And uh, Sunny was like, no, too busy for love. Save the world, acquiring adorable human pets. <laughs> and star, poor Starflight. Um, but it was kind of fun writing his story and introducing Fake Speaker because um, I was like, well, even if he doesn't get sunny, at least he has someone who does love him very much. And it was really fun thinking about Fate Speaker, and I actually almost kind of want to go back and write her whole story, because what was it like growing up thinking you had these powers, like really believing it so hard, <laughs> and being so wrong all the time? Um, I just think she's kind of a fun character, and like, maybe, you know, Starflight deserves someone who loves him that much, and so he'll be okay. Um, but so yeah, I get to book five, and Sunny was like, no, I don't want to have a relationship. I don't have time. I'm, I'm busy like meeting my mom, figuring out my whole backstory, meeting adorable humans. And so <laughs> the fun part of this was writing this scene where Sunny actually um, encounters a couple of humans. She encounters one in the Sandwing Palace, and then a couple, of more, a couple more like in the forests around the mountains. And I wrote this whole scene from Sunny's point of view, where she's listening to these humans. They're trying to communicate not very well. And at the time, I was thinking, wouldn't it be amazing to get to rewrite this scene from the human's point of view? So many years later, I finally got to do that in Dragon Slayer. Um, and it was exciting to get to like remember everything that I had thought the humans were thinking and write that scene where, from Sunny's point of view, she thought they were communicating great. <laughs> and then from the human's point of view, Maybe not so much. Um, or, they, or they think they're communicating something totally different. So book six, where we finally meet Moon, the first telepath in ages in the, uh, in the Nightwing tribe. I've always wanted to write a mind reader. I always think mind readers are cool, and I love the, um, the feeling of like, or, or the, imagining what it would be like to walk into a room and like, hear what people are thinking. I think in real life it would be terrible, actually. <laughs> but it was really fun to get inside Moon's head. And a really, I realized, interesting way to introduce all these other characters. Um, because in the first five books, Clay knows his friends really well. So as you meet them, you find out a lot about them just from the way Clay interacts with them. But for Moon, she's meeting total strangers. And I'm trying to introduce a whole new set of characters for the books six through 10. And so I was like, if she's a mind reader, it won't be just what we see on the outside. We'll also get to see what's on the inside of them. And that'll give us more insight into everybody we need. Um, except, of course, that I also wanted it to be a murder mystery. <laughs> and I was like, how do you have a murder mystery and a mind reader in the same book? Like, I think it's Kibble who's like, just, you know, wander around to the, um, the school until you hear someone being like, top murder I did there. Good job, me. You know? <laughs> Isn't that how you solve this? And she's like, that doesn't quite work that way. But um, so I had to come up with various reasons why she couldn't hear certain people or why the actual murderer um, like, has managed to shield their thoughts in some way. And I just wanted to show you this, because this is the next book that's coming. Um, yeah. <laughs> When Barry started it, he was like, oh my god, telepathy, are you kidding? <laughs> he was like, so more word balloons in every scene? And I was like, yes, just skip the art and just have me all word balloons. <laughs> he was like, no, that's not going to work. Uh, but Mike does an amazing job. I can't wait for you guys to see it. I just got my own copies um, at, at home, so it's like all shiny and new um, in my house right now. Book seven, a whole kingdom of tiger bombs. So... <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard this terminology, but I have talked a little bit about how this Wings of Fire series is um, a very much influenced by the fact that I became a mom as I was writing book one, and now I have two kids, and so I think about parenting a lot, like, as I'm writing. And I got to book seven and realized we hadn't been to the Ice Kingdom, and we hadn't really met very much of the Ice Wing tribe, so I could introduce them and sort of build the society in, like, a very specific, thoughtful way. 
And I was like, well, what have I done? What haven't I done? And what have I said about parenting? And what else do I want to say? So um, I've written The Helicopter Mom, which is Queen Coral, who literally ties her children to herself, a thing I fully would have done if they'd let me. <laughs> and I was like, what if we went in the opposite direction? Like, what if, or, you know, we have sort of the permissive um, style of the rainforest, where it's like, do whatever. Do we have kids? They'll take care of themselves. Um, I was like, what if we had a kingdom that's really based around the like, no, I'm gonna watch you all the time, and I'm going to make sure you do exactly what I say, and you have to live up to these expectations, sort of a like authoritarian um, style of parenting. And so I, that's where I started thinking about this tribe, um, about how they are constantly being compared to each other, and what it's like to live somewhere where it's just really competitive, and you know, every day you're like, where do I fall on this list of like the best dragons in the tribe? Um, how stressful that would be, right? Um, so that was sort of my beginning of my thinking about, about building the Icewing Kingdom. And then we get to Peril in book eight. <laughs> so a thing that a lot of people don't necessarily know about Peril is that my original plan was to kill her off in book five. Because she fit this sort of trope of a character who has done terrible things, right? And she really feels bad about it. And so what often happens with a character like that is that they save the day by sacrificing themselves. Um, I've read lots of books like this. And I don't know that I had thought about it consciously as I introduced her. But as I got closer to book five, I was like, probably the solution is Peril sets something on fire and immolates herself or something. But I kept getting letters from kids I think were really, really smart, who were like, don't kill Peril. <laughs> and I was like, I think they can tell. They can tell that she's that type of character. They're like, please don't kill her. Um, we love her, we want her to live forever. And I was like, yeah, I kind of want her to live forever too. And I'm so glad that kids wrote me those letters because instead of killing her, I saved her and I kept her for book eight. She has her own um, entire book about solving all your problems by setting them on fire. <laughs> trying not to do that so much anymore. And it was so much fun to get inside her head. This is one of my favorites um, of all those books because, you know, she's just such an interesting, weird, sort of crazy character, but she's working through it. She's trying really hard to be a better dragon. So thank you to the kids who wrote me those books. I mean, those letters. <laughs> all right, <book> nine. <laughs> it says you're breathtakingly uninformative because that's what Kibley says about Turtle's messages. If you guys remember those, if you have read these two books. Um, so books nine and 10 actually sort of overlap in time. So in book nine, we have a dragon named Turtle who sets off on like a quest kind of to um, follow this like scary dragon. And then in book 10, um, the dragon who's left behind is trying to figure out what's happening from a distance. So they have these um, tablets that one of the dragons has enchanted where you can write a message on one and it'll appear on the other. And the reason for this animus magic is I was like, what would I, what's the like, most like small and apparently useless magic that I can come up with? And I was like, it's like when I'm in the shower and I want to write down a note <laughs> that I own an idea I've had for a book, <laughs> could I like have something where I'd write it down and it would appear some, somewhere else? Um, and I was like, so that's something Turtle would come up with, like just very small magic, but Kibley's like, we can use this. But it doesn't work both ways. Kibley can't write back to him. And so it was really fun writing these two books. Um, and first of all, writing Turtle's book where he's sending the messages and he's like, oh yeah, this is really helpful. I'm totally sending Kibley like lots of good information. And then, and then in book 10, it leads to, um, you get to see Kibley receiving the messages and being like, what else? Where's the rest of the information? Are you serious with me? Um, including like, this is one of my favorite scenes where Kibley's like, I know, I know. He clenched his talons and tried to calm down. Turtle is the one I really feel like yelling at. Turtle, said Winter, isn't he the dragon in distress here? Yes, but, said Kibley, if you're going to send out a cry for help, shouldn't it be a useful cry for help with any information in it? Such as maybe, for instance, where the moon's blasted camel licking night kingdom is? <laughs> oh, Winter said, looking at the message again. You're right, he doesn't mention that. How are we supposed to rescue him? Kibley cried, flinging his front claws in the air. Well, we can't even find him. Why hasn't he sent me a message in three days? Just, hey, off to the Night Kingdom, two ghouls, and then, oh no, Eck, I'm trapped in the Night Kingdom, and nothing in between. <laughs> 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 Poor Kibley. 
hard to be this, the, the friend with all the ideas. So it was really cool, like getting to write these overlapping stories, and again doing that like from one perspective, you think something is happening, and then from another perspective, how they're actually reacting to it. And actually, I spent a long time trying to figure out who should get books nine and ten because I knew my five main characters for books six through ten, but I didn't know whether it should end with Turtle or if it should end with Kibley. And I went back and forth and back and forth about like. Should it go Turtle Kibley or Kibley Turtle? And I ended up deciding it should be Kibley, who's the hero of book 10, because the whole arc of books six through 10 is about like what you do with your powers, right? What you do with the things that you've been given in your life. Um, so it could be animus magic, it could be perils fire scales, um, and you know, people trying to control it, but you deciding for yourself what you want to do with the magic. But it's also about what if you don't have any powers, like Kibley? So I felt like he was the right dragon to end this arc on. So what it says is, with no power, also comes great responsibility. So Kibley's the kind of dragon who wishes he had magic, but even if he doesn't, he still wants to save the world and do his best to change things to make the world a better place. And then I started planning the last five books. So, or so far. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, so book 11 um, takes place across the ocean, and this was really fun because I got to sort of start over with the world building. I got to start planning what kinds of dragons would be over there, what's their whole history, and what I did know about them is that there's a dragon there who arrives like on their shores who can see the future. And like not just any future, but all the futures. And she can tell what's going to happen just by thinking like, okay, if I make this decision, oh, this is what happens next. Um, so I kind of built their whole history around Clear Sight and her arrival on the continent. And then I wanted to show you this. This is my terrible map. <laughs> I'm always telling people I can't draw, and I'm like, here's some evidence. Um, this is what I drew for the original like Pantala map. So I could send this to Scholastic and be like, they can come back with a real map. Beautiful map. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's better. Let's put that one on the map. <laughs> so, it, but it was really, it's really helpful to have a map like this. I can plan out where everything is and figure out like, how everything is connected and what's going to happen. Um, and part of figuring out the tribes for the, the books 11 through 15 was thinking about like, what could inspire them. And I started thinking about insects um, because I hadn't really done anything with insect names before. There's so many good choices. And um, so I did some research and I was like, what if I had my gentle tribe of like the butterflies and the moth names? And then I had my sort of scarier tribe that has like uh, the other insect names. And one of the very first names I came up with was Cricket. Um, and I get so excited because I was like, I love Cricket. Like, what a cute name. Um, my favorite magazine when I was a kid was called Cricket. It's still around now. I love it. I would get so excited every time we got one. And um, so I was like, this is perfect. She's going to be adorable. And then for my research, I watched um, a documentary called Life in the Undergrowth which is about all different kinds of like creepy bugs and all the different things they do. It was great for giving me ideas um, for the dragon's powers, but also terrifying because I'm already scared of insects. And you can see in my notes, there's one scene where they start talking about these giant crickets that actually can climb trees. And, they, and, it, and in my notes, I'm like, oh, what an interesting cricket. Wow, that's really big. Where is it going? Why is it climbing that tree? Oh my God, there are baby birds up there. Oh my God, stop, no, it's great. Screams for the rest of the page. So, <laughs> turns out there are also terrifying critics. I did not know that. I was like, no, I'm going to just keep my, my in my head the one from the magazine who's adorable <laughs> and apply that to my cricket who's not terrifying and would never be a baby bird. Oh, and then I wanted to share this because after I had written the books, we got a new puppy um, who started off small and has gotten bigger, um, <laughs> as you can see. So, she's the black and white one. Um, the white one is Rainbow Dog, who is um, he's about six now. He was named by my children six years ago. <laughs> we call him Bo for dignity. Um, but we, when we were picking the name for our new puppy, um, we, I suggested some dragon names, um, and the kid, and I was like, or anything you want. And the kids chose Bumblebee, which um, was great. She's really cute. She's a little bit of a terror, <laughs> kind of like the real Bumblebee, the real the dragon Bumblebee. Um, but She'll be okay. We, we love her anyway. She's hilarious. Book 13, it's gonna be terrifying too. So I'd done all this research on insects, 
And I was like, what else can I add to this landscape, this other world? How about some carnivorous plants that are large enough to eat the dragons? Um, and this was really fun research, because I knew about Venus flytraps. I didn't know about sun dunes or pitcher plants or all these other things that I managed to like blow up and put into the world of the poison jungle. And then in book 14, it actually, like, sort of the thing I haven't talked about much in this book, is my very first image, actually for books 11 through 15, was the idea of a group of dragons that are in trouble arriving on the shores of Pyria, needing help, and how the dragons would react to that and what they would do for them. And so this finally happens in book 14. That's why I say here, this is how Snowfall refers to them, an invasion of alarming rainbow dragons. <laughs> It's because they they need help. And her first reaction is like, no, stay out of my kingdom. I don't want to deal with anything. I just want to stay with my own tribe. And over the course of the book, um, she has she starts building her empathy is a big part of it, and kind of becoming more sympathetic to what's happened to them, which we saw happen like all through books 11 through 13. Um, so it was really interesting to get inside her head. And Snowfall also, I chose her as a main character because I had discovered like the fourth book problem. So the book four problem in a five book arc is that you've gotten to the big climax in the third book, but then you can't solve the problems until the fifth book. So book four is still important, lots of things have to happen, but the poor main character of that book can only sort of save the world. They can only like help, but they can't finish saving the world because we still have a whole other book to go. So I had done that to four star flight in book four, and then Turtle, who's in the butt in book nine. <laughs> he was like, I don't want to save the world, but I was like, you have to save the world. Um, and they were both very reluctant heroes, but I was like, I'm gonna write someone who's the opposite of Starflight and Turtle for book 14. I'm gonna write Snowfall, who is like very much in charge, absolutely happy to make decisions and control everything. Um, oh yeah, here's some rainbow dragons. Uh, this is Luna and Swordtail. Um, this is a piece of art that was that we made for, it's like a poster that you could get at one point, but I'm hoping we can actually put it out there where more people can get it, because I think they're so beautiful. And when I came time to write book 15, sort of the last book in this arc, I actually spent a long time thinking about who should the main character be? I didn't know this to start with. Should it be Luna? Should it be Swordtail? Should it be a dragon from back at Pyria? I decided it needed to be a self -wing. I wanted them to have a chance to save the day themselves, um, but also, um, you know, which one, and Swordtail was kind of a situation where he couldn't really do much about his problems in the beginning of book 15, so Luna seemed like the right one. But like it says here, saving the world and stopping the bad guys, well, like, hugging. <laughs> Luna is kind of a character who I was trying to bring together the themes of the whole arc, where it's like, Blue is our book 11, really gentle, sweet dragon, and then book 13 is Sun Dunes, is like ferocious, like, let's fight the bad guys, let's stop them, like the resistance dragon. And I was like, how do I bring them together in Luna? Who's like, yeah, I wanna stop the bad guys. I feel very strongly about this. But also she's like, just a hugging kind of dragon. She like, really wants to solve it in like a gentle, kind way. So that was really tricky, honestly, <laughs> writing this book and figuring out her character. Um, but I'm really happy with how it turned out. And it was fun to get into the, um, all the different human characters in this book too. I'm hoping one day maybe I can get back to what it was like to be them and like tell it from their side of the story. Oh my god, I'm just keep talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, can I ask someone what time it is? 11.30, okay. 11 o'clock. <laughs> I like how I was like, that sounds great, I'll just keep talking. Um, all right. Uh, would you guys be up for me reading you something? And then we can do questions. Um, because, so the next book after the sixth graphic novel that's coming out is a guide to the whole world of dragons. And this is something we've been talking about doing for a long time, but I told my editor we couldn't do it until we introduced the Cantala tribes and like that whole side of the world. Mm -hmm. So then we started thinking about it and our first thought was like, oh, it'll be like an insight of the Pyria world and the Pantala world and all the different tribes. But the more I started working on it, the more I was like, but who's writing this in that Pantala? Starflight, how about that? And then like, what stories does he want to include? And like, what haven't I told you yet? So there are a lot of um, little things that I wanted to get to. Like, who married Queen Scarlet? 
why would anyone do that? What happened to him? Probably bad things. <laughs> so I was like, I can only do that in a story. Or um, what happened to the mud veins when they had their like succession crisis a long time ago? So I had all these things I wanted to do into a story form. So it has ended up being very much like a collection of stories as well as all those like encyclopedia details. And this is one of them. <laughs> um, this is from the rain session. Starflight was like, we don't have a lot of scrolls by rain wings and King Kajoo. Like, I can fix that problem. <laughs> Just look at me, I'm ready to go. So this is King Kajoo's like essay that she wrote for class, um, in her creative writing class, I guess. And uh, and this is um, it's, yeah, and this is going straight into the guy the way it is. <laughs> All right. The stupendous story of a snuggly sloth by King Kajoo. Once upon a time, which is actually also right now, is it weird to write a story about someone who's still alive but started with Once Upon a Time? Moon says it's all right, and she has read more scrolls than anyone, except I guess probably Starflight. But if I ask him, I'm worried he'll say I can't. And it's such a classic beginning. I really want to do it. Okay, I'm doing it. It's my story. Maybe I'm being daring and literary. Maybe I'm breaking all the rules because I'm super avant-garde. Or maybe writers do this all the time, Moon says, although she often says, they don't usually start their stories with long parenthetical, she had to spell that word for me, asides and worries, because she says mostly those stay inside the writer's head, which is totally mystifying, because isn't writing all about putting everything in your head onto a scroll so other dragons can understand you and know all your thoughts? Moon says no, and that probably most dragons besides me wouldn't want everyone to know all their thoughts, and that maybe we should have a lesson on story structure and focus, but that's Boring. So, once upon a time, there was a very beautiful and cuddly sloth named Silver. Silver was clever and friendly, but she was also a little bit lonely. All the other sloths thought she chirped too much and needed to sleep more and be more quiet. She had one teacher who yelled at her all the time and wouldn't answer any of her really great, useful questions. Moon wants to know what kind of teacher a sloth could possibly have. And when I said, how would I know? She said, I was making up the story, so I can make up anything. So I said, all right, the grumpy sloth was a calculus teacher. And then Moon wanted to know if I had any idea what calculus was, which I thought was very rude. But then she said she didn't know what it was either. <coughs> and I said, it was something I heard Mastermind say in the Nightwing Fortress, and it seemed mathy, perhaps. And Moon asked, why by all the moons would a bunch of sloths be learning math? And so maybe I should make it like a nap time teacher or a climbing teacher instead. And I said, who is telling this story anyway? The answer is me. And there's a lot going on here. So stop worrying about what the teacher is teaching and think about how she is being mean to Silver, because that is the actual point. So, sometimes Silver was a little bit sad. I mean, she didn't think she was annoying. She just wanted to learn things and get better at stuff and be a really great sloth. And it wasn't her fault that most of the other sloths were rather smoothing or flopping around thinking about something, and acted like she was just the very most exhausting sloth they've ever met, right? Silver knew if she just had a chance and some training and some other slightly more energetic sloths to hang out with, she could do something awesome like save the world. And guess what? She was right! Moon says, I can't write that because I'm spoiling the end of the story. But she doesn't know the end of the story because I haven't even written it yet. So what is she even talking about? Also, maybe this is another very advanced literary trick that I have invented, and other authors are going to want to copy it forever. Moon says she is starting to sympathize with the exhausted sloths. What, what does that even mean? Silver liked to go out and wander the rainforest, hoping to meet other sloths who are more like her. Moon says this would be a good place for some description of the scenery. Ugh, I hate those things. Okay, fine. The trees were really green also very tall. Most of the time they were pretty wet because this was a rainforest. There were loud monkeys who were nearly as cute as silver and quiet snakes who were not cute at all. The wind went whoosh whoosh and the trees smelled like wet leaves. Is that enough scenery description? Moon says she is trying to write her own essay over there. In which case I ask you why she asked me to read aloud each sentence after I write it. And now she said she did not ask me to do that, which, hmm, I don't know, I'm pretty sure I remember her saying something like that. She wants to know if possibly I misinterpreted the conversation where I said, I'm going to write a story. And she said, 
That sounds great. Please do not read me each sentence aloud after you write it. I don't think that's what happened. I think her mind reading is cluttering up her brain and she just imagined it. That's what. One day, Silver was exploring a part of the rainforest that was full of dragons. Some flocks said it was dangerous to go near the dragons in case they got hungry, but Silver was quite smart and had noticed that several flocks had pet dragons, so she knew they were really probably easy to tame and not as bitey as they looked. Moon does not like the word bitey, which she says is not a real word, but if it is a word I can say out loud and you know exactly what I mean, then how can it not be a real word? I mean, seriously. Silver was not sure if she wanted a pet dragon, because what if her pet dragon also thought she was annoying? And what if it maybe ran away from her? What if she was the kind of sloth who just wanted to love somebody with all her whole entire heart and express that love with great enthusiasm all the time, but she never found anybody who wanted it? So she watched the dragons for a while. They seemed to like sleeping. There were many of them in many beautiful colors. But was one of them the dragon for her? And how could she tell? And then suddenly, a whole caboodle of new dragons arrived. Silver did not know how many, because everyone knows that slots cannot count beyond three. Moon is giving me a dubious face about this fact, so I am ignoring her. Most of these new dragons could not change color. There was a big hungry brown one, a small happy yellow one, a pretty big loud blue one, a wounded sad blue one, and a super intelligent, wise, noble, generous, brilliant black one who is clearly destined to be an excellent teacher who gives out top grades to students who work really, really hard, even if their spelling is not always exactly totally accurate. Moon says we are not supposed to verbal compliments all over the dragons who are grading these essays. But if I were a teacher and I had to read 35 endless scrolls by my students, and you knew some of them are going to be super boring, then I think I would be delighted to come across an occasional nice and obviously true remark about myself. Now she is pointing out that Webb is also one of our teachers, so just in case, a wounded, sad, very fascinating, and definitely never boring blue one. But the important part is that there was another dragon with them. She was one of the rainbow color changing dragons, but she was quite a bit louder and snappier than they were. She had this shiny, brilliant greatness that just radiated all around her, like maybe she had the sun inside her somewhere. When bad things happened, she didn't go back to sleep or hide her nose under some leaves or pretend it wasn't important. She jumped up and did something. She was a doer of things. And that made her different from all the slots Silver had ever known and different from all the dragons Silver had been watching. Like when the other main forest dragons shot sleeping darts at her friends, the new dragon yelled and got all stompy and made them come out and explain things. And when she found out dragons were missing, she went looking for them even though she didn't even know them, unlike literally everyone else in the village who did know them but did nothing. Although actually, that bit happened later, but Silver could probably tell she was just that kind of dragon by looking at her. I asked Moon if she wanted to twitch her eyeballs at me for writing nice things about my queen, too. But she just gave me this quiet, sad, awful face and said, no, that bit's all right, and she thinks she understands my story now. Which is so weird. Moon is so weird. It's just a story about a lonely little sloth finding a dragon who can take care of her. Three moons. So, Silver followed the new dragon, whose name turned out to be Glory, all the way back to the rainforest village. And she watched until Glory fell asleep. And then she carefully, carefully, slowly, slowly inched her way up the dragon's shoulder. The sloth curled up in a little sunlit hollow of Glory's back, where she fit just right. And that's where she fell asleep knowing she had found the perfect dragon, and that from now on, everything was going to be much better, and they were going to live happily ever after together. The end. P.S. Moon wants to know what happened to the saving the world part, which just goes to show you, you shouldn't think you can guess the end of a story. But also, obviously, Silver saved the world by being such an excellent sloth friend to Glory, that Glory was able to do many awesome world-saving things. It is much easier to save the world with friends who support you and love you no matter what. Also, I ran out of room on this scroll, so I figure I should end it here. <laughs> Moon says she is shocked and can't imagine how that happened. Like, hello, this is my very first story. And plus, besides, I have decided I am a writer who shares all the thoughts in my head. Plus also all the conversations around me. It is a literary style choice thing, and I think other ranglings will appreciate it. Thank you very much.
and I think the way we're going to do it is to line up at these microphones. Um,
Yeah, I would love to include her in any of your work, for sure. Thanks. How did you come up with um, all the like special abilities that are rare in each tribe? Like for the liquid, you speak, and um, night wind, so like, um, Sure, how did I come up with the special abilities for each tribe? Um, yeah, good question. I thought about it a lot. I did a lot of like, what would they all have, like from their habitat, like the scorpion tails in the desert? And then what could they, some of them have that would make them different from the others and like would be a power that they have to learn to work with? Um, I guess especially the least speak, I was thinking about Sundu. Um, and I wanted there to be like, I wanted the lead weeks to have something that made, made them sort of like special compared to the other tribes. Thank you so much. Um, and so I thought, well, what could it be? Could it be like growing plants and like, what could you do with that? Like, how could that be a power? Um, so I don't know, I guess I just I thought about it a lot. And with the night wings, I was like, I'd love to write a mind reader. <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? And terribly complicated. Thanks. Awesome. Um, so this is a very theoretical thing because I'm taking some For, art, uh, for um, authors is a really big thing because that gives a fresh start. So if there were to be a Wings of Fire reboot where it's put in the future, would the Night Wings and the Rain Wings be what tribe after so many generations? That's a great question. The question was, if I went further into the future, would the Rain Wings and Night Wings still be one tribe? Or would they have split up, right? Yeah, or would they become a different species of Jackson? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I think because that's how I think the beetle wings evolved, like into silk wings and hive wings, is like sort of in the opposite direction, like one tribe splitting up. Um, so yeah, it would depend how far forward I went. I'm actually really interested in what it's like to be glory right now, like trying to hold those tribes together that are so different and have like very different trauma that they're both that they've both gone through, kind of because it's one, you know, one one, one cause to the other and still making it like a cohesive tribe. So I can imagine like a far distant future where there are some hybrids that are like Nightwing, Wingwing, like their own new tribe, where there are some that have decided, no, we're never going to, we just want to keep our own thing. Um, like the ones that have gone on with the uh, fierce team together. That there's definitely going to be like their own separate Nightwing tribe. I think that will keep going. But I don't know. It's, 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 it's a lot to think about. I love that. <laughs> How many years have you been writing Wings of Fire? How many years have I been writing Wings of Fire? I can tell you because um, I turned in the outline for the first book like a week before my son was born. Luckily he was like a week late, otherwise I'm not sure I would have gotten it done. So I've been writing it for as long as he's been alive and he is 12 and a half now. He'll be 13 in February. And he's taller than me. I did not prove that. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Are the tribes going to start like crossing the ocean and interacting with each other more? I really want them to. I think it's a long journey, so it will take a while to kind of, um, you know, set up a path that's easy to follow and like build that connection between them. But I think most of the dragons that I've introduced, at least, would really be interested in that. Would like would love to get to know each other more and sort of support each other. So I think so. There's actually a there's a whole like fan fiction alternate universe out there set on an island between the two continents um, where there's like a university. And I love that whole idea that there's like somewhere where all the dragons like come, like some from this direction, some from this direction, and get to know each other. Like that's, that's the kind of thing I love. So yeah, hopefully. <laughs> why don't, why haven't you wrote a book like with one of the queens as the main character? Why? Like, you always write the books, but like, as one of the dragons is the main character, but you have a more like, book of one of the queens as the main character. Where a queen is the main character? Is that what you said? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, well, so it's book 14. what it's like to be like the youngest queen of her tribe. Um, and, and what well, it's like, not like, 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 like
dragons, and that's why Book 14 I chose like a kid queen. But it, I think it would be interesting to write like short stories from like Ford's point of view or Ruby's point of view. I think actually it would be really cool. Yeah, that's a great idea. What's your favorite type of dragon to write about? What's my, oh, to write about? My favorite tribe of dragons to write about. Um, that's a good question, because usually when I get my favorite tribe, I'm like, oh, I want to be a raven. But to write about it might be the ice wings, because they're so um, rigid, and so they have like, all these rules, and it's very like interesting to get inside their kingdom and try to imagine what it's like to be them. I also got to write a whole story about the mud wings um, for the guide, which I haven't gotten to do very much in the books, so I'm excited for you guys to see that, because I kind of like the idea that there are these like groups of brothers and sisters that just love hanging out with each other. So maybe them too. Or maybe two. Maybe two. Thank you. 